three, two, one. Good afternoon. This is Audrey Russo. Welcome to a Monday and this is business as usual with the Tech Council. And I'm joined here today by my partner in crime on all good things. That's Jonathan Kirsting. He's vice president of media and all things related to marketing and storytelling. So today is uh, yesterday actually marks 30 years from the signing of the American Disabilities Act. And today within a finite period of time, we're trying to do a little bit of a deep dive with two people who are gonna provide us with um, some interesting perspective. But before we get started, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors and uh, that's Sheets, Huntington and Deloitte. They've been partners of ours for a long time. Sheets has an innovation center now in Pittsburgh and Deloitte has been um, very, very active in the tech community as well as their participation in uh, many things in terms of technology and innovation. Same thing as Huntington Bank, our partners right from the onset. So we thank them. I also wanna um, point out as we proceed that we actually have closed caption today and we're very excited about that. So for anyone who is hearing impaired, there is an opportunity for you to just turn on your closed caption, captioning and it's right at the bottom of your screen next to reactions. So really appreciate that service. And uh, we're glad we have Gloria here with us today. She's the magician behind the scenes making this possible. So I also wanna tell everyone we've muted you and we've done that on purpose so that we can make sure that there's no noise in the background and we can hear our guests. And I also wanna tell you that there is a chat. Please use the chat. This will be a great opportunity to exchange questions. And I wanna launch right into our guests because this, a lot of information to cover and lots of opportunities to hopefully ask some questions. We have two guests today. One is Paul O'Hanlon and the other is Aaron Steinfeld. And Paul is, you know, Paul is um, a little self-deprecating, but he's been doing a lot of amazing things over the journey of his professional life. And uh, he's been involved in advocacy, in um, in housing, in he's a lawyer. He is someone who has deep knowledge about um, lots of things that have happened inside our region in terms of people with disabilities, as well as what's happened even nationally. I think you're really going to be interested. Yesterday in the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, there was an op-ed that he wrote, and we'll dive a little bit into that in terms of his perspective on the American Disability Act and what, what it means to be inclusive and how well we've done. So thank you, Paul, for being here. And then I'm also joining us today is Aaron Steinfeld, and he is with the Robotics Institute. He's a professor there at the Robotics Institute, which is in the School of Computer Science. And many of us know we have deep relationships over there. And it was thrilling to be able to reach out to Aaron and because his expertise in innovation and technology. So I'm gonna thank them both for being here. So we're gonna bring first to the screen is Paul O'Hanlon. And I could talk to Paul about a lot of things. And uh, I, I really wanna start out by first of all, thank you so much for taking the time with us and for your work over a long period of time in your career, being an advocate and even for what you wrote yesterday in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, many people might think that 30 years, you know, um, the signing of the American Disability Act and okay, we've done our jobs and uh, now we can proceed accordingly. But I think you have a very different view of that. And uh, so on that note, I'd like to give the floor to you so that you can, you know, share with us your perspective as well as some of the things you articulated about yesterday in, in uh, the Post-Gazette. Um, well, actually it was Friday, but um, Friday's Post-Gazette, but, um, um, but thank you. And um, uh, the, the funny thing about being on Facebook is that it reminds you what you did or said a year ago or five years ago. And I, I was reminded that a year ago, um, I, I said in a speech that perhaps the greatest attitudinal barrier for people with disabilities in Pittsburgh today is the attitude that we're doing a good job with accessibility. 
Um, I think that the sense is that, um, you know, a couple curb cuts here and there, and, you know, it's all good, we're accessible now. And, and, and there's not really an appreciation for just the breadth of disabilities, you know, the, the fact that um, I have a mobility impairment, but um, somebody who's blind has a whole different set of challenges. Someone who's deaf has a completely different set of challenges. Um, and so, you know, as you kind of play out all the different um, possible disabilities and look for, you know, what are we really doing to accommodate people? Um, it seems a little bit light, you know, so that's, that's kind of my, um, my overall impression. Um, but yet, and, and the other part of it that I guess that, um, you know, I, I think people struggle with is understanding the breadth of the ADA, you know, that most people kind of think about issues like steps and buildings and things like that. But really what got me um, uh, involved in disability issues was um, accessible buses. That when, when Pittsburgh started to get accessible buses um, uh, for the, really the first time in my life, um, I saw disability advocacy as being um, important because I could see that there was an, there was a possible impact for my advocacy. Um, so, um, so in a certain sense, um, that's, I guess my, my brief introduction, which is that the ADA is a whole lot broader and bigger than most people think. And that there's a lot that we, um, really kind of gloss over, um, with respect to all the different disabilities. And, and, and the, the thing that I, I guess I want to emphasize too is that um, what, what, what I would um, assert is that pretty much every time there's an evaluation of the accessibility of a system and there are modifications made that what I, I, I would assert is that pretty much everybody after that actually has a, a better um, experience of it that usually you know the, um, you know, people people without disabilities are using curb ramps all the time for, you know, pulling um, uh, suitcases up uh, sidewalks and things like that. And there's just you know you you sort of become um, used to um, accessibility. And you know at some point I think people stop even understanding that it's accessibility. Things like texting was started as a accessibility tool for deaf people. So it's just sort of, you know, an ongoing evolution of kind of discovering what's needed and, and moving forward. Well, it's very, it's very complex. When people use the word disabilities, there is an array of understandings and misunderstandings, I think, about what that means. And you have and we'll get to some of your points soon, but can I ask you quickly, sure. where were you 30 years ago when the ADA was signed? Well, I, I was a lawyer. I was a housing um, landlord, tenant, public housing, section eight sort of specialist. And um, I, I kind of joked that I, I was going about my life minding my own business when these accessible buses started showing up on the kind of periphery of my vision and I started to think, well, damn, I mean, I, I had never really had an opportunity to be on a bus. So um, I was joking to a friend that I was tempted to just get on and ride for a couple of blocks. And she said, well, Port Authority won't pick you up if that's not a designated accessible route because they'll be afraid that they'll take you somewhere and you won't be able to get back. And I said, well, I was only planning to go a couple blocks anyway, and shouldn't that be my decision? And, and that's what kind of got me to start to get involved, that I could, I could see that there were decisions being made that um, people with disabilities would make different decisions if they were involved. Right. So. Person-centered, absolutely. So let's, let's jump to Aaron, and I introduced him a moment ago. He's in the Robotics Institute, which is part of the computer science department, and he is on the innovation and technology side. So thanks, Aaron, for being with us today. 
and your, your work is really expansive and it's a focus obviously on technology and innovation. But if you could talk about the premise of your work and some of your research, I think that will be really interesting to our listeners today. Sure. So uh, as a quick background, uh, I grew up around disability work research. Uh, my father uh, did a lot of, does, still does a lot of research on the architectural side of uh, accessibility. Um, it was involved in some of the original standards that then got rolled into the ADAG. Um, the, that's the architectural accessibility parts of the ADA. Um, I see a comment in here about universal design. Uh, this is actually a core part of uh, the work that me and my team do. Um, we focus heavily on technologies and new technologies that will enhance uh, uh, people's lives who have disabilities, but we try to do it in a way that includes uh, benefits to people in other communities. Um, so in the disability space, we talk about assistive technology. So that's like a wheelchair uh, or a white cane for someone who's blind. Um, and a universal design, which is something that has value to a large part of the population that removes a barrier uh, to people with disabilities. And so Paul mentioned curb cuts. That's the kind of the classic example of that. And so our team has been looking at things, everything from information systems like uh, transit, bus transit, uh, information systems, all the way up to uh, robotic systems, such as robots that will help people move through a complex transportation hub or building. Um, and we don't really, uh, narrow ourselves on a specific kind of technology. Instead, we focus on problems and specifically problems that come up from the disability community. And if you're in the technology space, you always hear stories about, you know, listen to the users, you're not the user, um, uh, uh, gather input early, keep maintaining contact with your users throughout the process of development. We do the same thing in research. You know, our, our research problems are driven by problems that are identified by the, by the community. Um, and then we work up towards a, an interesting solution. And many times there's a really fascinating research question behind there. It's not just a design a new product. It's more about let's find a way of solving a problem that doesn't quite, ex that doesn't quite have a solution yet. And then we try and get that information and knowledge out to companies to turn those into actual real products or to the community to be adopted by the rest of the, the technology community. So can you talk about a project or two? Sure. Um, so some of you may actually use the Tiramisu uh, transit app. That's actually our one of our research test beds. Um, uh, the current version does not include crowdsourced uh, vehicle fullness, but that is actually uh, in, the, in the early versions. Um, uh, we did that uh, primarily because uh, one of our participants who uses a wheelchair was, you know, quite ha uh, happy with some of the work we were doing but they rightfully pointed out that if the bus is full, they're not getting on and it doesn't really matter uh, the other stuff we're working on. Um, and so uh, we looked at how uh, to provide the information about fullness. There was no easy way of doing that at the time. So we uh, decided to try and crowdsource that. Um, we rolled that out here in Pittsburgh. It was used uh, by a large number of people for a while. Um, uh, as the technology on buses got to the point where it was possible to query the uh, systems on the buses about how full they were and feed that up to servers and then back down through uh, uh, mobile phones, um, we were involved in some of the specification uh, work being done by the community. Um, and now in many cities, when you open up Google Transit or some other apps, you will see an estimation of the fullness of the buses. Um, and some of those labels are actually the same labels that we used back in the day. Um, and we've done some work with others to help translate the, uh, the measurements that are taken by the bus to these human understandable labels. Um, and so uh, that's an example of a research uh, uh, effort that was motivated by people with disabilities that then kind of worked its way through the technology community to become a standard or a de facto standard um, and is now being uh, rolled out across the world. Um, what's interesting is people are now also starting to take advantage of this for COVID work uh, to try and get a, a sense as to social distancing on the buses and trains uh, for the same types of applications. So trying to figure out who's after, how many people are on that particular yeah. vehicle and not, so, not going on it to keep Yeah, it so they, they use light sensors on the buses at the doors and that's how they keep the counts. Really interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Who would have anticipated that? So I, I, we'll get back to you in a second to talk about some more material um, 
opportunities here in the work that you're doing. So, so Paul, much of the adaptive technology it, that's needed is paid for through government programs, right? A big chunk of it, yeah. A big chunk of it. So what does that mean in terms of, of access? And how, has that changed over the last 30 years? And how has that impacted people like who need tools to be mo you know, mobile? Um, well, uh, well um, I, I, should, I should start off by saying there has been huge changes. And I don't want to minimize the changes that the ADA has made. Um, part of what ha happens, though, is that like everything else, the ADA happens in the context of a whole lot that's happened before. And, and so one of the things that you see um, as far as um, I, I'm a data geek, I'm a policy kind of a person. And, and when you look at the data of disability, the thing that you're forced to kind of concede is that as a society, we have confused thinking about disabilities. So on the one hand, you see in terms of like some federal data, you're only a, a person with a disability if you're not working as a result of some disability. So disability is sort of synonymous with I'm too disabled to work. And so there's a lot of categories that define your disability by your inability to work. And then there's people like me who have a lifelong disability. I use a, a power wheelchair and yet, you know, I worked full time. And, and so, um, I'm, you know, there's a lot of sort of noise and confusion that you see all over as to whether people are disabled or what we as a society will do with them. So, for example, um, some government programs will provide me with adaptive technology, um, but only in my home, because the assumption is I'm too disabled to work. Why would I need to go out? Therefore, you know, I only need things to you know, keep me um, happy in my home. And so um, all of this ends up with, to some extent, a lot of confusion and noise about um, government programs because we don't have one definition of disability. We have a number of competing definitions and depending on what department, uh, it, it, it kind of gets weird and bizarre. So, but, but the short answer is, um, usually, yeah, uh, I would say state buy, you know, state payers are probably some of the most common. But the other thing that I would say is that a lot of technology is um, purchased as a result of employment, and and often those decisions are actually made by the employer as to what technology to buy. So if they hire an employee who's deaf or who's blind, um, then there's going to be some uh, accommodations needed for that uh, worker and often it's the employer making those decisions so those wouldn't necessarily be government purchased kind of technologies so really i mean the importance of being a self-advocate is even probably more important than for those of us who are referred to as temporarily able-bodied yeah so this really, this work of the ADA really applies to all of us. That's sort of the way I look at it. And I see that Bill Frase has said that too in the chat. If we don't have a disability now, it's helpful to think of ourselves as only temporarily abled. And that's one of the reasons why I thought it was pretty important to have both of you on the show today is to, is to remind everyone that advocacy and, and self-advocacy, while difficult, it's got to be embroiled into all of our worlds, whether we're leading companies or we're working alongside of people. And that's one of the things that I've learned from talking to you, Paul. You made one comment that I just want to state that, that really made me think differently all weekend is as people are having outdoor seating, for example, and the outdoor eating that we've been having right now so that during COVID, and, and I love outdoor eating and that's awesome. But when you put those tables and chairs in places that 
in the past would be accessible for people who you know need different kinds of mobility that now it becomes really tough to try to navigate and we've also lost some parking spots mm -hmm. in terms of you know uh, quote unquote the handicapped parking spots and those are things that decisions are made without any kind of input from people who need to navigate differently right yeah yeah i mean the um, just just moving a handicapped parking spot, what you discover is that there's somebody that was depending on that spot being there, you know, that, um, and most people kind of, I, I think, aren't aware that there are so many people who, mm -hmm. you know, depend on that. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. So let's, let's jump to Aaron. You know, human-centered design is the essence of, of all innovation, but it's highly overlooked when technology is designed. Give us some examples of problems with technology solutions that many who are not currently disabled would over, overlook. Yeah. So it, this, is, this is, as with most technology situations, this is varied and spread across a wide range. But one of the byproducts of the Silicon Valley move fast, break things kind of model um, is that quite often, you know, the minimum viable product is released. And, quite a, and what that typically means is that the minimum viable product does not include any disability features. Um, and this is, of course, problematic, uh, especially when those features uh, completely prohibit use by someone with a disability. Um, the reality is that um, uh, there are many ways of making things accessible from the beginning, even under a minimum viable product approach. You know, for example, uh, if you're pushing an app out to the App Store, both Apple and Google provide a lot of opportunities to, to make sure that your system is going to be accessible from the beginning with not a lot of work. Um, uh, it's when people start trying strange things that quite often you run into problems. Um, similarly, the web accessibility is not as hard as, as most people would like to think. Um, and you know, there's been standards out there for web accessibility for quite a long time now from the W3C. Um, and we're seeing a lot of websites pop up you know, daily without any uh, uh, real adherence to these standards. Um, the reason why this is important to also consider as a technology provider is not just that the person with a disability has problems getting access to your system, um, but this also impacts their friends, their families, and so forth. Um, so for example, if you make a communication app and you're trying to get users to join, um, the, anyone who, has a, who uses a screen reader and can't use your app, they're going to be resistant to using it. And likewise, the people who interact with them are going to be resistant to moving over as well. So you have this sort of network effect. Um, and so it's really important to think about not just the fact that there's a population with a disability, but there's also the population ad adjacent and attached to them uh, that you have to think about as well. Um, you know, you're not going to bring a microwave that can't be used by one person of the house into the house. Instead, you're going to buy a microwave that can be used by everyone in the house. And so this is the sort of thing that uh, if you're a company, you need to start thinking about from the beginning. Likewise, if you're building buildings and you're like a building owner, you should be thinking about things like visitability, uh, access uh, without having to go around back or through a service entrance, um, these sorts of things. Don't just think about oh, it looks pretty to have a bunch of steps leading up into my building, or this reminds me of tenement buildings in New York City. Um, instead, you should be thinking about things like, okay, that you can't get into. And if you can't get a wheelchair in there, you also can't get a stroller and you also can't get a delivery cart. So think about universal design approaches to buildings and products from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, really, that's a really great thing. Jo Jonathan, you wanna ask a question? Yeah, um, that's the one I just put into the, the chat myself, believe it or not. I'm just curious how, how Pittsburgh kind of ranks compared to other cities as far as creating more accessibility throughout our infrastructure. So it's, it's good and bad. Okay. Um, uh, we have built in problems. Uh, so for example, if you have a steep hill, it's very hard to safely board a, uh, a bus on a ramp, you know, through a bus ramp on a steep hill when the, you know, the terrain is just, the geometries are just making it very hard. Um, uh, on the flip side, um, there has been a fair amount of effort by uh, different parts of the city to uh, uh, make things accessible. Um, uh, we do see initiatives like the visitability initiative. 
um, and uh, installing uh, talking crosswalk signs uh, throughout a large part of the city. Um, the downside is, of course, uh, that we have uh, a lot of old buildings and it's very hard to retrofit old buildings. We have a lot of uh, older equipment and it's very expensive to retrofit some of those things. And then there's been some choices that uh, have long-term repercussions that are still being dealt with. And Paul can talk more about those. Absolutely. Um, another question from, from Bill here real fast. Uh, what's Paul's sense of how well Pittsburgh is doing with regard to employment for people with disabilities, both in general and in the tech sector? Um, I, I, I know that the um, national figures indicate that um, one of the areas the ADA so far has not really made much of an impact on is employment of people with disabilities. And um, I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a fine um, enough uh, uh, sense of Pittsburgh versus the national, to be honest with you. It, it, seems, um, it seems that it's still quite challenging for people with disabilities in the area of employment. I mean, employment, um, over the last 20 years is, I mean, everything's, you know, in flux in the sense that, um, you know, we're, we're much more into a gig economy these days. There's, there's been all kinds of changes, but um, I, I think that in general, people with disabilities are still struggling in the area of employment. I think some of this is also outright discrimination and misconceptions about the abilities of the people that they're, who are applying for jobs. Right. It's a, it's a fear of the unknown as well and lack of experience and perspective. Uh, or it's a, well, I know, I know, I remember this person who is, you know, who has a disability from when I was a kid and they couldn't do this job and they don't stop to think, you know, well, right. could mm -hmm. they? And the answer is quite often, yes, they could. Mm -hmm. Those are, yeah, those biases are real. Mm -hmm. And so what, what would the both of you like to tell the tech community and the people who are listening, if there's a kernel of, of advice or guidance that you would like to be able to say to the people who are listening and share with the tech community in Pittsburgh? Like to say anything, either of you? Well, I, I mean, I, I'll start. I mean, my, my sense is that, um, that the tech community by its nature, um, I see as both, as one of our potential allies because um, uh, in, in general, as a person with a disability, new is better. You know, that um, when you look at everything that was built before, it was clear that there was absolutely no attention to disability and, and, and accessibility. And so in, in general, my, my bias is new is better. And so, you know, technology is certainly by, um, by design and by necessity, um, constantly, you know, uh, a fight for the new and innovative. Uh, and, and so in that sense, um, I think that technology um, is, is sort of our friend. I think that what Aaron brought up before though, is that it's, there's also countervailing kind of pressures on technology to be the first, get it out first, um, cut the corners to get it to the market, and that sometimes that leaves people with disabilities behind. But um, but generally speaking, I, I'm, 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 I see technology as being uh, a key to our future. Yeah, and, and the current scenario we're in with COVID is actually a great example of this. You know, prior to COVID, the idea of working remotely or working from home was probably something that a lot of people didn't consider viable. But now we're seeing a lot of businesses can pull this off. Well, that actually makes a huge impact on your pool of people with disabilities who are eligible to work for you. Because quite often, the biggest challenge they have to getting to work for you is just getting to work, you know, the transportation of getting to your, to your site. And now that you all start figuring out how to work remotely, um, that opens the door to potential employees uh, that you in the past may not have, may not have uh, had access to. Well, I can't thank you both enough for, for the time that you've spent with us today. And what you can see there's lots of people thanking you for, for being here and how do you solve the big global issues. I, know that we could, I knew that we could have spent an hour with you easily. 
Um, but we're, you know, we're, both of you are fairly easy to have access to. So I'm assuming that if there are people who are interested and want to reach out, we can share your contact information. And uh, thank you, Paul, for being an advocate for so many years and uh, reminding us that we to build an inclusive region needs to be at the forefront of everything that we do. And uh, Aaron, thank you for the research that you do and the passion that you take in terms of this work. And you're right here. Sometimes we just don't know all the rock stars that are sitting right around us. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we try to do. So in a nutshell, the American Disability Act, 30 years, let's, let's see what happens in the next 30 years and what's really changed. And, and uh, that's, that's the exciting part. And I think Aaron's right, as Paul, technology is going to make, make a difference for the future. There are tech companies that are um, in our membership that are also rock stars, like Toby Dynavox does a lot with assistive technologies and Abater just released their, um, I think they have their 360 access that they just released. Yep, yesterday. Bender, right, and Bender Consulting does um, placement for people with an array of disabilities that are uh, placing them in technology jobs. And they have a huge partnership with Highmark as well. So there are good things that are happening, um, but we won't rest on our laurels. So thank you, Paul O'Hanlon, and thank you, Aaron Steinfeld. And we will see everyone here tomorrow at the same time. Who's on tomorrow, Jonathan? David Kane from Ethical Intruder. It's all about cybersecurity. Be there or get hacked. That's great. Well, thank you both. And I can see here that Laura said two rock stars. So thank you both. And uh, everyone, let's not forget 30 years was only the beginning. Thank you both. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you.